Anno 1800 is a game that I saw for the first time at Gen Con 2022, it seemed interesting, it had the name of Martin Wallace on the cover, which is of course uh, not nothing, it's attractive to me, and so I decided to give it a try. And at the beginning it may look a little bit overwhelming, but uh, it's complex but not too complicated once you get the general idea. Each player will start with an island that has some uh, places for workers, some industries and some ships and a shipyard and you will be expanding your island by adding new industries, by adding new areas to the island itself, by creating connections with faraway lands that you can trade with and all and the reason why you're doing all that of course is to score points. This is a Euro game in the purest sense, meaning that you're gonna trade something for something better, you're gonna upgrade that something into something better still and upgrade after upgrade you'll be able to score points and hopefully you'll score more points than the than the opponents because again victory points is what we're going after. So here we have a display that goes in the middle of the board again a bit daunty but don't 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 be too worried about it. It represents the different industries that we can build as the game progresses. So for example, if I decide to build a coffee making industry then I need to produce those resources and then I take this style, I flip it to this side, now it is the build side, it shows me what it produces and the kind of workers that can produce that thing, that can go there to produce that thing, and I can place that on an empty slot on my island, I could also cover one of the existing slots if I so desired. We have workers there, different kinds, of farmers, uh, workers, uh, artisans, engineers and investors, each with their own box on each player's personal display to organize where they are, to place them there when they are available. Then when we want to use them to work, we're going to transfer them to different locations, to different industries, so they can do what they're good at. And then we have these cards, population cards, super important. For each cube on your board, you will draw a card from one of these decks. So for farmers and workers, a card from this one. For these other three, a card, or a card from that deck. These cards will have a cost on top, indicating what you need to produce to be able to play. So for example, if I play, if I produce canned food and beer and I have this card in my hand, then after I produce those two, I can play the card, I gain another cube of that kind, that's the reward for that one, and after I play, I also draw another card from the corresponding deck. Every time you get a you you get a cube, you get a card. But other other cards will give me different advantages. Yes, this one, for example, will give me an engineer, and then again a card from this deck, and so on and so forth. Other cards will give me a different benefit, such as an extra action and, and different tokens. Upgrades. So I can upgrade cubes from one category to the other up to three times using that benefit. So, for example, I can upgrade that farmer into a worker, for example. And of course, these cards are also worth victory points. So, after you play it, the benefit is a one time thing, and then usually the card goes in your scoring pile. And what is important is that the hand of cards, uh, and they'll become from a hand of cards at the beginning, they may become quite a stack in the middle of the game. The hand of cards is also your timer because the end of the game is triggered when you get rid of all of them, which seems also impossible at the beginning of the game because I play a card which gives me more cubes, uh, sometimes more cubes than I had before. Uh, I mean, I play a card and gives me two more cubes, and it feels like an endless cycle, but it's not because uh, at some point you may have a hand uh, of effects that do not give you new cubes, you may, have, um, you may use game effects to swap cards with the deck precisely to kind of get rid of, of the cards that give you more cubes when you don't need them anymore, there are different effects that will give you that. So yes, the end of the game will arrive at some point, the player that triggers that 
Ghost takes this token, the Fireworks tokens, which is also worth 7 victory points at the end of the game. You finish the round, you play one last round, and at that point, um, after the end of the game has been triggered by somebody discarding all their hands, all their cards, after you're done, you count victory points. So, uh, again, super important to play cards <laughs> during the game. In general, in order to perform actions, you need to produce goods. And you produce goods in uh, several possible ways. One way is super simple uh, worker placement, which is you will uh, move your workers to locations that produce the goods that you want. So, for example, this round, say, I need bricks and potatoes. Uh, very important things in life, so I can put a worker here, a farmer there to produce potatoes, an artisan here to produce bricks, and that's it. I can demo I demonstrated that I produce those things, now I can use a game effect that requires those. Resources cannot be saved, so in next turn I cannot just say I have those there. Now those workers are occupying those spaces which are not available anymore, the worker is not available anymore, but they are not producing constantly, they did their thing. So they only produce things for the turn in which you move them from their storing area to the corresponding space. So that's one way of producing goods. Uh, another way is you may spend gold, one of the resources in the game to recall workers, which both free up the worker and the and the space. And oh, I'm producing bricks again, or I'm producing boxes this round with that cube. And the cost in gold depends on the number uh, on the type of worker indicated there. You see how much it call it costs to recall them. Also, you can trade your ships or some of your ships, I should say, will produce trade tokens. And you can use them to produce goods that are not producing your board or they're on your board and uh, at the present time you don't have the ability to produce them. So they're gonna say, say, hey, who is producing, hey, who's producing chocolate, I need some chocolate. And somebody who can produce chocolate tells me, hey, I do it. In which case, I will discard the number of trade tokens depending on the number of worker that I'm basically replacing with these tokens to use to, for the privilege of using someone else's industry. The player uh, cannot refuse that you'll be trading with them, but also why should they? Because they're gonna get gold in the process. And this is a very important mechanism because having industries means that you're just getting this uh, money for free as people are using your industries. So, moving workers from their homes uh, to working places, recalling them with gold to then use them again and using trade tokens are the ways that you produce the goods that you see indicated there which will uh, which will fuel the actions that you can take. When it is your turn you take one action, exactly one action for that action and that action may be again after I produce the corresponding goods to play a card. And again, suppose, okay, I'm gonna produce break this round. I don't have any beer, can somebody, does somebody have beer? Yeah, I produce beer, okay. I'm gonna spend trade tokens to produce beer on your board and you get a gold from the supply, not even from me, then I can play the card. So again, playing a card is one of the possible actions. Or I can choose to expand, super important. I can expand my island by, again, producing the resources indicated there uh, to acquire the corresponding tiles. Say I wanna build a sausage factory. And then again, then I have a new thing. That can be my action for, for the turn. I can swap population cards from my hand to with the corresponding deck. It does not change the number, but it may change what I got there. I can increase the workforce, that is, I can produce resources to basically buy a new kind of worker and the cost is indicated there. So to buy a new artisan, I need those resources there. Yeah, there's a lot of information on the board, especially around the different kinds of workers, such as, again, what you need to pay to acquire one, uh, what it costs to bring them back in gold, uh, how much, how many trade tokens it costs to activate that 
a kind of worker on another player's board or use another player's industry and also the upgrade another action I can do I can upgrade a number of my workers so for example if I want to upgrade these workers into artisans I can do it and each of them for each of them I need a box and, and coal and suppose I do that then I simply will return a number of these cubes to the supply and I will replace them with an equal number of cubes of the upgraded persuasion. So again, increase the workforce by acquiring new workers, upgrade them by uh, spending the resources that you see in there, open up the old world so you get more land to build your industries and when you take that action, you will need a certain number of exploration tokens. The first time is one, then two, then three, then four. They become increasingly more expensive. You can also only have to four of these new sections of the old world and you will place them next to your initial board. They all come with a printed advantage, plus you have more space too build new industries and also to get more ships. I should have mentioned that when you're taking the action of developing new industries you can also instead decide to build new ships and shipyards. The shipyards come in three in three styles, three types, level one, two or three and each allows you to build more powerful and more efficient ships. So for example a shipyard level three allows you to build this one here which will provide three trade tokens each round. This one will provide three expression tokens each round, level two and level one. I think it's pretty, pretty intuitive there. So again, I can spend my action to add new areas to my board. I can also similarly spend expression tokens to make connections with new lands. And so they will give me more options to trade and so this is how you trade uh, for exotic goods spending trade tokens and this will allow you all to have different goods that you can produce to create different to create different things uh, also they will give you more cards to add to your hand and these cards will if you fulfill the requirements in the same way as the population cards they will allow you to draw uh, these cards here. These cards here don't have any effect during the game itself. They will only be used at the end of the game. Each represents a zoo and a museum where you want to send your workers at the end of the game. And each has a corresponds to a specific kind of worker. So suppose that I have those cards there at the end of the game. I will score points I'll show you in a minute. I'll score points for each box in zoos and museums that I can I can fill up. So at the end of the game, I can take my workers and I can fill up those boxes. And again, each that I fill up will give me the corresponding number of points. Three for that one, uh, one for that one, two for that one, for example. As an action, as my action for the turn, I can indeed also choose to draw cards from this deck, which again is could be useful later in the game because scoring is always good. Super important action you can take is to celebrate a festival, which simply means you're going to recall all of your workers from wherever they are. They will often be in industries. For some game effects, efforts, they need to be exhausted. That simply means instead of going to a specific place, they are spent. But when you uh, call a festival, when that is your action for the turn, you recall all of your workers from wherever they are and they become available. Again, you're just resetting your opportunities there. Objective cards. Each game will have a number of objective cards uh, taken randomly from this deck. Some objective in the variety is huge, uh, including the type of cards that you have, because some of these cards will give you ways of scoring points at the end of the game. If, for example, you have certain things or uh, different kind of, of requirements that you meet. There are also cards uh, from the uh, objective cards that may give you uh, different actions that you can perform. In which case uh, the actions performed from those uh, mission cards, uh, from those objective cards, they are 
They count as three actions in addition to the action that you take normally. It sounds confusing, but uh, it makes sense because uh, the theme and the mechanics uh, are really, really close to one another. They mirror each other very well. Expand your industries, get more workers, train them to become better workers, get more land, get more ship, and make more money, increase your power, trade more. At the end of the game, when somebody's done with all their cards, complete the game, and then the player with the highest score wins the game, and the score, the points will come from the population cards that you have collected from those mission cards, objective cards that I showed you earlier, from these other end of the game cards with zoos and museums, so different other sources. Play with us, player with the highest score wins the game. I know 1800. A setup can be a little bit elaborate with all of those industries that you need to place exactly in their in their spot on the board, uh, but. If you finish a session and you place them in different bags based on the color, the red ones, the purple ones, then the ship ones in another one, then uh, it's not that hard. And I mentioned this first so that so we can get rid of all of the negatives that I can find in this game because I like it very much. I think it's a really fine game. It's It exemplifies all the good things that modern game design has done in the last 20 years, all of the good things that... Uh, Eurogaming has achieved. It's all here. You have relevant decisions with virtually no luck. Maybe at the beginning, in the opening hand, if somebody can build engineers early on and somebody uh, doesn't get them from cars, they have to go through the steps of upgrading them. Maybe. But that's a very, very minor thing. But everybody will get so many population cards. Everybody will get trading cards and different things. So it changes what you get, but not the overall value. Everybody will have a range of options. It exemplifies, again, the fact that you have a lot of decisions to make uh, in a regime of very limited luck, for sure. It exemplifies the fact that players, now we know we have loss aversion, we don't like to lose what we worked hard to get. And you never lose anything here, no one takes away things from you. The fact that other people are doing well doesn't necessarily detract for, from what you can do. It looks like it's in many other games that it's a parallel race towards opportunity, again, rather than limited things. But, oh my gosh, they built that industry before I did. In other games, that may feel like a limitation here it may even be good for you. There are cases where it's a lot more efficient for me to trade with your industry and to keep using the one that you built rather than having to build my own. And the rulebook says that explicitly. Every time, every turn, you get something more. You build something new, you get more stuff, and other people building uh, their own things gives you more opportunities. And I think that's that's really nice. We've just discovered in the last uh, in the last two decades that we prefer to acquire and develop and increase and improve rather than to lose stuff or st still or to see stuff taken away from us. This game exemplifies that very very well. The production is really nice, all the components look nice, the art is nice, the, the cardboard tiles are thick and pleasant to to manipulate. Everything works well. Again, the rule book and the setup, I mean, I've seen players looking like, whoa, how can I ever play this? But the rule book does a very good job of explaining the game. There are very nice player aids to give one to each player and then teach the, teaching the game is, uh, is a breeze. And uh, we for a game that has so many moving parts, wheels within wheels, branches from each tree, which you need to kind of like reverse engineer to have that good, I need that good. For that, to have that good, I need that industry. For that industry, I need that worker. For a game that has all of this like almost reverse technology tree here, the game actually plays remarkably smoothly thanks to the fact that each player only has one action. From time to time they get a bonus, uh, a bonus action, which basically means a bonus turn, since you have an, an action per turn. But again, um, it's maybe it's like to produce two things, to move two cubes, to play a card, so even players take that extra turn, it doesn't slow down the game too much, it doesn't create too much analysis paralysis. Again, 
uh, there may be a little bit of analysis paralysis if a player does not have like a mid mid range mid term kind of objective in mind but if you get a sense I want this industry and so I know that to have that I need that kind of thing and that kind of thing and that kind of worker then you got your own script in mind for the next two three turns and, and the game really moves fast I was pleasantly surprised by that for a game again with this amount of decision I was pleasantly they surprised that I felt like my turn came around very nicely, no problem there. So I'm very pleased with this game. I'm surprised that it did not come out, you know, by design with the solitaire option because the game lends itself very well to that. I'm just surprised they missed an opportunity to write one to four in the box because that automatically increases the number of people that will buy. That's just the way it is. We have more people now that also enjoy uh, playing the game solitaire than we had 10 years ago, for example. And so, and the game really, I'm, I'm pretty sure somebody has devised some solitaire variant because it should be very easy. Again, the what other people do can be replicated by removing some industries from the main display and making them available for trading instead of, uh, of building them. Uh, from time to time you roll a die to see if you get some goal for free or simulating the fact that other people are playing are, are using your industries so we simply having some industries becoming available for trading and some goal coming in you have basically simulated the agency or the other players because again in in the real game with other people uh, if I trade with you, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter if there's a human agent. I could trade with you when you have left the room. I just put a goal there and I'm using your industry and I take my turn. So you can... There, there will be ways, I believe, of playing the game. So I'm just surprised again that they didn't capitalize on that because the game is almost multiplayer soul, which again is something that people enjoy very much these days because less tension, no confrontation. I do my thing, you see, you do your thing, I got my busy work, you got yours, and at the end we'll see who did best there. So Anno 1800, this is an excellent Euro game, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I, I'm going to recommend it to anybody who enjoys economic, economic games, Euro games, because within this genre, it's a very good exemplification of what recent game design can achieve. A demanding game at the beginning, but not as much as I thought, and definitely a very fulfilling and satisfying game.